2 Samuel chapter 11, and we're going to read verses 1 and 2. And it says, In the spring of the year when the kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. And they destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Verse 2. Late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty (laughs) taking a bath. Now, with that being said, (laughs) with that being said, I want you to close your eyes and I want us to pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we just thank you so much. For the comedy that you bring in the gospel, Lord. For bringing us to this place where your grace is sufficient. Where, Lord, we know that that you have brought us here, Lord. We just ask that your Holy Spirit cover this place. We invite you once again to be a part of this service. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, this last break, I was uh, fortunate enough that I was uh, in Mexico, Monte Morelos. And uh, I had my tacos of carne asada and I had my, you know... My um, all my favorite foods that I could imagine, I had them all, but unfortunately, I also got sick. So please excuse me if you're watching online. Please excuse that my voice sounds so raspy. But but this break, something happened that I want to share with you. You see, in Mexico, for those of you who have never been there, most of the places in Mexico, right, guys that that are there from have been to Mexico, they don't have carpet. Okay, you see this carpet? We don't. They don't believe in carpet. They they like. You know, everything is, is uh, just tile, okay, tile concrete floors. And it just so happens that in Mexico, my in-laws had a very tall bed, very, very tall bed. You see where I'm going with this. And being that it's a tall bed and concrete floors, it's a perfect combination for someone to get hurt, right, for someone to, to fall off the bed and really do damage. So my youngest, Tiago, volunteered to show how hard <laughs> the concrete floor is on his little head, okay? So one day we were bathing them. We we're getting ready for, be- for bed, and I turn around. My, my oldest is playing and playing, and he turns around and he kicks my youngest son, okay? And my youngest son doesn't have his balance, and he literally falls like this. <sighs> At first, I thought he had broken his arm. You know, we were all like, ah. And everybody was like, take him to the hospital. So we're taking him to the hospital because he has this huge bump on his forehead, okay? He already has a big head. He doesn't need anything else, okay? So um, he has his dad's head. Um, It's kind of funny. Yeah, it's it's okay to laugh. So anyways, we have this we have this incident on our vacation and we're thinking, you know, this is terrible. This is not a good way. We're thinking he has a concussion, you know. And so we're there at the doctor. And I'm thinking the worst, you know, like any ordinary parent. And the, the doctor says, no, he's fine. As long as he didn't black out or throw up, he's good to go. And my son was like, uh. and they asked him, do you know what your dad's name is? And he's like, Mm-mm. and they're like, do you know what your mom's name is? Like, Mm-mm. and I'm thinking, man, this kid is messed up. So anyways, Thank God nothing happened. But, but there's a phrase that I, I, I came to and I, I want to share with you guys, and it's this phrase called stay close. What do you think about when you hear this phrase stay close? Hmm? Uh, what, what comes into your mind when, when you hear someone say stay close to the wall, right? And stay close to mom and dad. It's this level of protection, right? It's this level that if you're too far, you're probably going to get hurt. And in the case of Tiago, he was too close to the edge, too far from my reach. And when they were playing, he fell because he was just too far away. You see, there's something about staying close and being safe that go hand in hand, don't they? This, as we start off our new year, As we start off in 2019, I want to invite you to stay close. Stay close. Get closer. I I notice that the the space between me and you is getting a lot farther. But I want you to get close. Get close. Why? Because the closer you are, the safer you will be. Because this is the phrase that I want you to take with you. 
Because be safe by staying close together. Say it with me. Be safe by staying close together. Now you can repeat it, guys. Be safe on this side over here. Be safe. All right, you guys can read. Okay, awesome. So be safe by staying close together. Why? Because there's something about being close that actually protects you. There's something about being close. Now, we realize there are things that in our lives we, we need to face alone, right? So going alone is good, but it's not always helpful. It's not always beneficial, right? I'll give you some occasions. Going alone to a job interview, okay? Do that, please. Now, some of you millennials, you've probably never heard of this, but we've heard of this, right? That there are people who are taking their parents into job interviews. And the parents are now being, are interviewing the people who are employing their children. Do not do that. Please do not. No lo hagas, okay? Don't do that. Don't bring mom and dad and say, how are you going to help my child? Don't do that. Now, I understand some of you guys don't drive, and if mom brings you and she stays in the car, or, you know, dad brings you and they stay in the car, but don't bring your mom or dad to the job interview. That's the thing. You go alone, right? You go alone by going to the restroom, right? You go by yourself. You don't ask mom, mom. Now, girls, you guys got to explain this to me because this is something that girls do all the time. Why do you guys go in groups to the restroom? There's never been a guy say, hey, bro, all of us, all 10 of you, let's go to the restroom, guys. Come on. Come on, guys. We all need to go to the restroom. What is going on? What is in the restroom that all 10 of you girls need to go at the same time, right? There's only two stalls. The rest, everybody else, what are you guys doing? I don't want to know. Don't tell me. Happy Sabbath, okay? But the idea is this, okay? Why is it, shh, why is it that there are times where going alone is beneficial, but most of us know that we are bred, we are made to be in community. Just a few months ago, we talked about this when we said that we were created to be in a community. We were created to be in a group setting. And this is what we do here in the upper room. We try to provide environments where that happens. We try to provide environments where you can meet new people. And my staff know, we say this all the time, the evaluation of what we do here is, did you meet someone new? And if you didn't, then it was a failure, okay? It was a failure. Why? Because we're in the business of connecting people. So when we say going alone, we don't expect you to go alone to everything. And some of us have this, you know, Lone Ranger type mentality that, that, you know, I don't need the church and I don't need, you know, to be a part of a small group and I don't need to be in a Bible study. I don't need to go to the upper room. Well, let me just tell you this. The Bible clearly states, and I invite you to open your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, if not, no worries. We have it up here in the screen. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12. You probably heard of this verse at most weddings. It's a very common verse in most weddings, and it says this. A person alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. There are even better for a triple braided cord, which is not easily broken. The two words that I want you to take into note is the can be. Now, I'm not Marcel. I know Marcel's like a eight degree black belt. But, um, you know, I, I've done boxing. Okay, I could defend myself, I guess, sort of. I know Marcel could break you and twist you and put you in a knot, you know. Um, but the idea is this. What I understand is, if you were to be jumped, okay, if you were to be jumped, it's less likely for you to get hurt in a group than by yourself, right? By you being alone, you're prone to getting hurt. You're not Chuck Norris. You're not Ronda Rousey. You're not Marcel Dulac, okay? <laughs> Love you, man. But here's what you have to understand. You have to be dependent on something and it's interesting that that Solomon says here three are even better for a triple braided cord is not easily broken but I thought he was talking about two ah who's the third person God God is the third person 
You see, what keeps relationships together, what keeps things coming together and staying close and being safe is having God at the center. Let me ask you this. Listen, eyes up here, guys. Eyes up here. Is God the center of your life? Is God, eyes up here, guys, eyes up here. Is God the center of your relationships? It's good to have relationships. It's good to have friends. And I, and I notice that when you guys come here to the upper room, you guys see each other, you haven't seen each other all week or perhaps in the last two weeks, and you have a lot to say. But let me just tell you this. Is your conversation about God or is it about what you're going to do later on? Is your conversation about God or is it about who and who is dating and who and who is not dating? Okay. Listen to me. What Solomon is saying, a person can be attacked. Why? Because we need each other. I love what one of my favorite authors said in, in, a, in a sermon. He says, the tree needs the soil and soil needs the rain. Rain needs the clouds. Clouds needs the air. Air needs the trees. But what, people, what do people need? We need people. We need people. Come on, you, you know this, right? You can go to the mall. You say, I want to go to the mall today. And that's a good idea. But you never say, I want to go to the mall alone, right? You always say, who wants to come with me to the mall? You can say, I want to go watch a movie. I want to go see the new Aquaman. I want to go see the new Spider-Man, which I haven't seen either or, but I heard the Spider-Man's better. Um, and you're like, I want to go. But you typically say, I want to go, but then you say, who's with me, right? Because you realize it's not so much fun if you go by yourself. And this is what we have to understand. We need people. And being in high school, the currency, guys, the currency is people, is friends. Let's be honest. Who are the most popular kids? Ah, you could fill in the blanks. Are they always by themselves? Never. Okay. Never. Why? Because they're always surrounded with a group of people. There's always their friends around them. We need people, but what kind of people? We talked about this a, a few months ago, and we said, you need helpers, not downers. And a lot of us, we hang out with downers, people who bring us down, people who make us go just to, to, to the bare minimum. Yeah, we don't have to do that. No, nah, we don't should, you know, we don't have to go there. No, no, no. And we, they never help us get ahead. They keep us down. Sometimes we need to just cut, cut the cord. Cut the cord and say, you know what, I'm done with the downers in my life. No, hopefully you're not sitting next to one. And don't say that to them either. But the idea that I want you to understand is you have to surround yourself with people who will help you get better. Because if you think you're going to do it by yourself, you're faking it. And you realize right now that you do need, you do need to be surrounded with good people, people that help you. Because what tends to happen is that we create this idea, this bubble, that we don't need anyone. Let's be honest. When we read the story that we just read in, in, in 2 Samuel, we come to the conclusion that David had come to a point in his life that he didn't need anyone. He was the king. And because he was the king, he felt like, hey, everyone has to look up to me. Everyone needs to obey me. Everyone has to do what I ask them to. And what happens is we, too, create this idea like David, that we don't need anyone. Ah, my spirituality is fine. Leave it be. No, I don't really need to go to the upper room. I'll just go to the balcony. No, no, I don't really need to go to the upper room. I'll just hang out in the parking lot. No, no, I don't really need to pay attention to the sermon. I'm already here. They already asked me to be here. That's enough. Guys, let me tell you this. What I want you to do is not just be here, but I want you to grow. And part of what we do in the upper room is we want you to be in places where your spirituality grows, not just fills in the space. We thank you that the seats are full, but what we want to know is, are you being fulfilled? Are you being nourished? Are you growing in your spiritual walk with God? I love what God is doing here. And as we talk about small groups, we realize, we realize this. We need to be in places where we can get the help. Because what happens is we become unteachable, and the title for this message is unreachable. 
We come so close-minded that we think nothing and no one can help us. And this is what happens. We tend to drift. Okay. We tend to drift. And, and this is something that I, 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 I think we've all experienced, right? I love Caleb's honesty when he preached this, when he talked about this earlier in his prayer. That perhaps this week we didn't put enough time with God and we put enough time for, for Netflix and our friends and all that kind of stuff. But let me tell you this. We drift, don't we? Carelessly or un, you know, consciously, we, 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 just, we tend to veer off the track. And I'm pretty sure David, when he was sitting in his rooftop thinking to himself, he's like, well, what do I do now? Everything I see is mine. Everything that, I, that has gone in my life, it's, 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 it's good. So he starts to see, well, what can I do? And this is the idea that tends to happen because when you start to drift away, you don't realize it, but you're already moving farther and farther away because perhaps king david had in his mind like well i'm the king no one can tell me anything no one can say anything i'm the king and and you know anything i see is mine don't we drift sometimes too maybe you've said this well i'm 16 now i'm in high school okay i can do whatever i want or maybe you said this i'm a senior now so therefore i can go wherever i need to I don't have to tell my parents it. Curfew, what's a curfew? Adults don't have curfews. Maybe you've said this, you know, now that I'm 14, <laughs> I don't need to obey my parents. Now that I have a driver's license, who cares? And you start to drift, and this is what happens when you drift. Drift always is slow, but it's always progressive, isn't it? You don't realize this, but you've said this before. I don't need you to tell me anything because I already know. And David came to a point where he was on a rooftop looking down and seeing someone bathing that was not his wife. And in his mind, he says, I can do this. This is normal. This is natural. I'm a man. She's a woman. I can tell. Okay. And he justified his lack of spirituality because he began to drift. Let me tell you this, guys. And listen up. Eyes up here. Eyes up here. We're shocked when we hear people, oh, no, did you hear? Mr. So-and-so had an affair. What? Oh, no, Mr. Mrs. So-and-so, she left her family. What? And we're like shocked, like, oh, my goodness, when did this happen? How did this happen? But let me tell you this. What you see there is something that took place months and perhaps years a few years ago, when I was pastoring at another church, which will remain anonymous, the youth pastor ran off with one of his students. Okay. Being married, having kids 14 and 11, left his wife for a 16, 17-year-old girl. And they moved away, they got married, and they had kids. Listen to me. We're like, oh, that's so disgusting. Ah, oh, que sucio, fuchi, you know? Hold on. We might look at him and say, what a pervert, right? What a mean guy, what a jerk, and we could use all kinds of adjectives. But when I sat with him and I talked to him and I asked him, I said, hey, man, like, did you think this through? Did you have any idea what this would cause? And he says, look, I could tell you this. For almost a year, I slept on the couch. For almost a year, my wife would not even talk to me. And now people are shocked and they make me the monster when she was treating me this way and that way. It was my way of just saying, I'm done with this relationship. I'm done faking it. Guys, what happens there on the rooftop started months, started years before. What David did had already happened in his heart. And when David looks at this woman and sees her bathing, he thinks to himself, what harm is this? Because he felt, and this is something that I, I, I believe so strongly. Can we go to the next? The next one. I'm going to have to have you guys. Isolation makes you vulnerable to predators isolation makes you vulnerable 
to predators. Let's go back to 2 Samuel. Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 11. I think I got it. Okay, I got it. All right. 2 Samuel chapter 11. It says, late one afternoon after his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. What is he doing? He is, he is on the roof, right? He is roof, he's on the roof and he's watching this woman take a bath. What we don't understand is this vantage point is David's eye is, in, is the same way as David's, uh, what's happening in David's eye is the same thing that's happening in David's heart. David believed that he was untouchable. David believed in his mind that nothing could happen if he went down this road. And we know this story. Maybe you don't know the story, but I encourage you to read it in 2 Samuel chapter 11. What it basically says is this. David realizes that he's done wrong because he sleeps with Bathsheba. She gets pregnant. Then he tries and he tries to get her husband to go home so that he can clean up the mess and basically say, oh, that baby is mine. And time and time again, he fails. Why? Because he tries using his mind and his logic to clean up the mess that only God can clean up. And what happens is eventually he takes matters into his own hands and has Uriah's killed. Now, guys, what does this have to do with anything? What this has to do is this. Where are we in our spiritual walk that we think we don't need anyone else? Where are we in our spiritual walk that we think that we don't need any help? Because eventually what happens is that, you know, David brings Bathsheba back in, and we'll see in just a couple of seconds, and this is what happens. Both of them believed that they were smart enough not to fall for it. Here's, here's what I, I know that we, we sometimes put the, the, the weight on David and like, oh, man, that's so messed up. But come on, Bathsheba, really? You, you're thinking you're just going to go take a bath and no one's going to see you where there's houses above your house, you know? But here's what we both understand about both of them. Both of them believe that they were strong enough that they couldn't fall into temptation. And the thing is, maybe I'm speaking to you right now. That maybe some of you guys are in relationships or maybe some of you guys are in habits that you think you're smart enough to control. The Bible says don't put fire on your lap because eventually you will get burned. And many of us are playing with fire. Many of us are playing with things that we know we're just a couple of seconds away from a lasting consequence. What happens with David is a sad tragedy, but what comes to mind is this. There was a person that came to the rescue who was at arm's reach for David. Something that we talk about here in the upper room, we say circles are better than rows. We believe that not just do you get blessed by listening to the, prayer, to listening to the sermon, but being in a circle, being in a group. And what I want you to know this morning is God wants you to be in a circle. God wants you to be in a group where you can grow spiritually, where you can grow and become the greatest spiritual person that you've ever thought you could possibly be. Maybe you need to be in a small group that you can be encouraged to make that decision to get baptized. Because one thing I realize, and this is what I want you to understand, that when we see, we see this story go off towards to, you know, to the abyss, Nathan comes in, and Nathan is the prophet, and Nathan comes to David and says, he tells him this parable about how this man who had lots of sheep steals this poor man's one little sh uh, sheep, and David throws a fit and says, I can't believe this. Who is this guy? We're going to have this guy killed. And Nathan says, you are that man. The Lord God, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. And it was then that David realized how far he had gone because it was a Nathan in his life. Guys, you and I surround ourselves with friends, but true friends don't just party with us. Don't just, you know, hand us a beer or hand us a joint. True friends say, you know what, where are you going? What are you doing? 
Why haven't you come to the upper room? Why aren't you part of a small group? You should do this. You should do that. You might think, oh, man, you're just making this so hard. Why do you keep telling me all the things that I need to do? Because you need Nathans in your lives. And I love what second uh, uh, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 7 in the contemporary English version says. You can trust a friend. Say it with me. You can trust a friend who corrects you, but kisses from an enemy are nothing but lies. You can trust. You can trust real friends tell you your real problems. You can trust real friends say, you know what? I don't like what you're doing. I don't like who you're hanging out with. I don't like what you're becoming. Those are true friends. But if you hang out with people like, yeah, let's go, let's do this, F this, and ah, right? Then those are the kisses from the enemy. Those are the compliments you get like, oh, yeah, you're 16. You don't need to obey your parents. Oh, yeah, screw them. They don't need to tell you what you need to do. No, true friends corrects you. And let me tell you, if we had more Nathans in our lives, mercy, right? 2018 would have been much better, wouldn't it? We need more Nathans in our lives. And that's why we believe so strongly that in the upper room, you need to be a part of a small group. Be in a system that helps you grow spiritually. Guys, David was reached not because he was too far. He was reached because someone came close. Nathan came at a point where where only Nathan could have reached David. And what we do with our small groups, we put you in a group setting, not with strangers, not with creepy people. We put you in a setting with your own friends, people that you hang out with, people that you feel comfortable with, that you could be open with. So, guys, be safe. Be safe by staying close together. Be safe by being a part of a small group. We believe 100% that if you are in a small group, your life will be different. So with this being said, I want to encourage you that you can have a Nathan in us, that you can have a Nathan in the upper room, that we can help you grow spiritually. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much. We thank you that David was saved. We thank you that David was rescued. And unfortunately, consequences did follow, Lord. And unfortunately, things did not go as you would have loved them to go. But Lord, we thank you so much that there was a Nathan that came and rescued David, that there was a Nathan that came and spoke truth into David's life. God, we're praying for the Nathans in our lives. We need young people. We need people who do not want to conform to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your spirit, God. We want young men and young women who have a conviction, God, to live their lives not just to please themselves but to please you, God. So as we start 2019, we ask a blessing over three wonderful young men and young women who will be baptized today. We thank you. We love you. I know heaven is throwing a huge party with all those sounds everywhere because people are excited, God. We are so thrilled that today we celebrate with you. Please bless us now. We thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen.